Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start top down with uh, work that's ongoing related to thinking completely about what should be taught in the 21st century from the ground up on all topics. And then I'll delve into STEM and then math in particular. So looking at uh, STEM on top down, why, why do we care so much and why so much more? Uh, first of all, it underlines science, technology, and engineering in the scientific method, of course. And if you look at the top 10 breakthroughs according to the World Future Society, all 10 require mathematics, quantitative literacy, from alternative energy to virtual education to smart robots, whatever it is, it requires that sort of numeracy. I'll let you read this uh, lovely little piece of research by the National Bureau of Eno Economic Research. Need some skepticism on that, mathematically too. Well, you can see why I would not be too uh, popular with the American Bar Association. <laughs> if, you look at, <laughs> if you look at uh, the top 20 bachelor level salaries, 19 out of 20, arguably construction management is not that quantitative, but that's, if you pass me that as an exception, 19 out of 20 are STEM related the top 20 bachelor salaries. And then it's also STEM competency for the rest of the world, not just the direct careers. So the adjacent careers, what I call influential professions and everyone. Meaning marketing and sales and trade professions, uh, whether they're in support of high tech and finance and so on, or it's the HVAC um, technician computing duct sheet metal thickness. It's influential professions like journalists and often misleading representations or financiers who need to be taught probabilities, right? Um, or lawyers and politicians and doctors who need to understand the, um, <coughs> the research they're using. It's really everyone. It's everyone understanding risk, whether it's personal finance or healthcare, cancer, airbags, cell phones, flying, and so on. But really deeply understanding life itself it's not about the mathematics of a log curve. It's about diminishing returns, the concept of diminishing returns that we want people to know. It's not really about the bell curve. It's really, is there a difference between median and mean, and what does that mean in real life? So uh, John Allen Pauls, uh, uh, author of A Mathematician Reads the Newspaper, has this lovely little quote, numbers and probability provide the basis for statistics, which together with logic constitute the foundation of the scientific method. And without the scientific method, we have a situation like this cartoon here, uh, de de depicting the former uh, US administration saying, oh, well, just teach both theories, let the kids decide. So should we be teaching chemistry or alchemy? Well, just let them decide. Phrenology or neurology, magic or physics, although physics is actually ahead of magic, in my opinion, nowadays. And <laughs> astronomy or astrology, or math or numerology or cosmology or mythology or evolution or creationism. You see where that leads. So with now looking at what, putting the accent on relevance, uh, which is what, of course, uh, in so many ways Conrad was talking about. I took uh, the taxonomy that uh, Wolfram uses from algebra to topology, and I've mapped the usage in various disciplines. And actually, Conrad, we can do that actually more scientifically with the data you have, even mm -hmm. if you have a, a, a biased uh, subset. But still, we can see what matters where to whom. And you realize very quickly that after numbers and operations, it is statistics and probabilities that has the widest usage. And it's taught the least, at least in the school systems uh, that I'm familiar with. Actually, that's pretty true worldwide, including the advanced PISA countries. Uh, another example of something quite useful would be recreational mathematics. And we saw the example here that Wolfram gave us the little, uh, the little paper uh, construction kit. Um, it helps children go from action to representation to abstraction rather than jumping straight into abstraction as we do too often. And that helps battles the fear of math that which we inculcate at a very young age, unfortunately. Then on the how. It's a question of skills, not just the knowledge itself. It's knowing how to, how to use it. In other words, you don't learn how to ride a bicycle by reading the manual. So if you look at um, PhD median salaries, in Silicon Valley, $125,000 for an engineering PhD. Germany, 100000 roughly speaking. China, 54. India, about 40. So how do you justify the 2x to 3x differential 
and don't get offshored. You can offshore an actuarian. It means that you have to create all sorts of other skills alongside the knowledge, such as creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration. And you'd ask, well, how can I do that in math, creativity in math, really? Well, if we only stop at solving an exercise or a problem, that's really not helping anything. But if we ask the students to solve a class of problems, that's already better. Using non-standard solutions, that's even better. Creating new problems, that's even better. And creating a class of problems to force them to think at the meta layer, all the best. So this is just one example. There are myriads of things we could go through of this. Uh, if you look at uh, even mechanical engineering at MIT, the difference between what is taught, like fluid dynamics and, and thermodynamics and so on, versus what's used pervasively in real world, like communication and testing and system thinking, same, same dif difficulty. And lastly, of course, here's an example of creative use of technology as well. Can't call tech support. So thank you. Thanks, Charles.